Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us today, especially today, because it's a very busy time of the year for everyone. So thank you for being here. Um, my name is um, Magda Maswan, and I'm one of the group leaders uh, at the RNA Research Center here in Poznań. Uh, just to give you an intro to who we are, uh, we are a consortium of RNA-centered laboratories based either at the Adam Mickiewicz University or, or at the Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry, both in Poznań. Uh, so we've got two talks today showcasing some of our research. Um, each of the talks will be around 25 minutes. Um, we will have questions and answers at the end of each of the talks. Please, please put your questions in the Q&A box uh, and I will read them out uh, after each of the talks. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Jakub Dolata. Uh, he's a young PI at Adam Mickiewicz University. Uh, he did his PhD uh, here as well, uh, studying co-transcriptional uh, RNA processing. Um, he did quite a few months of stay as, as well at John Brown's uh, university uh, uh, lab at the University of Dundee. Uh, Jakub did his postdoctoral training at uh, Martiensen's uh, lab at Cold Spring Harbor, where he studied small RNA modifications. And then uh, having moved back to Poland, he set up his own group. He got received funding to further study uh, epitranscriptomics as well as microRNA biogenesis in plants. So Jakub, looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. So good morning and good afternoon, uh, good evening uh, to all the listeners to our our series of seminars. I will share my screen. Okay. Okay. So uh, thanks, Magda, for for the introduction and giving uh, opportunity to present uh, our results today. Uh, and I will be talking about uh, small RNAs, microRNAs in plants. First, I would like to... Um... Jakob, it's not in the same. Excuse me, could you... Can you see, can you see my screen? Uh... You need to put it in presenter oh. view. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right now, it should be fine. Okay. Sorry for that. Okay, yeah. Okay. So uh, I will start with the, a brief introduction uh, uh, about microRNA biogenesis in plants. Um, so most of you probably know that uh, small RNAs, microRNAs are uh, very powerful uh, molecules, 20, 24 nucleotide long, and they uh, are involved in the regulation of, of gene expression, mostly post-transcriptionally. In case of plants, uh, most of microRNA genes are independent transcriptional units, uh, sometimes very long. Some of them uh, may have introns and undergo uh, alternative splicing as well. Uh, in opposite to the uh, to animals, uh, in, in plants, entire biogenesis uh, takes place in the nucleus and both uh, steps of, of cleavage uh, is, is uh, taken by um, dicer like one protein. Um, and uh, for, for many years, uh, we, 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 we thought that uh, once the transcript is uh, produced, uh, then it's released to the nucleoplasm, and then uh, in so-called dicing bodies, uh, we have these two steps of, of uh, processing to finally release mature uh, microRNA. However, uh, our recent results and, and the results published by others uh, indicates that uh, microRNA biogenesis in plants is uh, co-transcriptional. Uh, and um, our recent results also um, uh, underline the, 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 the function of RNA modifications uh, in, in uh, RNA, uh, microRNA biogenesis and, and, and their function. So, uh, I would like to start to uh, with uh, with with um, the story uh, published many years ago 
um, we once we we learn that uh, microRNA uh, transcripts can have introns, we ask the question about the role of the introns, and we found that the presence of intron uh, in microRNA transcripts uh, is important for uh, production of mature microRNAs. Uh, what is more important, not the, the 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 presence of the intron, but in fact the the splice five prime splice sequence uh, was uh, crucial for uh, maintaining the, the proper level of, of microRNAs. So, and, and you know that uh, splicing is co-transcriptional process. Uh, so we, we thought that uh, also biogenesis of microRNAs, processing of microRNA precursors could be uh, co-transcriptional. So this is why we uh, try to, um, to look deeper in, in, into this. Uh, so we start with um, visualization of, of uh, microRNA uh, transcript in the Arabidopsis cells in the nucleus. And uh, no matter what kind of probe we use for, for localization, uh, if it was uh, um, against the uh, intron, exon, or, or spliced uh, transcript, we always um, uh, were detecting uh, one or, 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 or two, maximum two spots uh, in in the nucleus, uh, which uh, may indicate that that this is the uh, site of of transcription. Um, then we uh, try to uh, colocalize this uh, nascent RNA transcripts with RNA pole two, both phosphorylated at serine five and serine two, and you can see that there is a very nice colocalization. And between this nascent uh, uh, prime microRNA transcript and uh, polymerase. Also, uh, when we marked a newly transcribed um, uh, transcript with 5-bromo-U, uh, uh, and we could also uh, find this perfect colocalization between uh, microRNA transcript and newly transcribed uh, RNAs. So uh, it indicates that uh, Biogenesis transcription uh, and, and, and biogenesis uh, processing of microRNAs occurs uh, in the same uh, place. Um, if you are familiar with uh, plant uh, microRNA biogenesis publication, uh, uh, you can find uh, the term dbody. So dbody is uh, or dbodies are spots in the in the nucleus. Uh, when you can find uh, HIL1 or DCL1, so components of plant uh, microprocessor. And uh, often you can, uh, people count them and, and uh, based on that judge if, if the, the um, biogenesis in particular condition is, is better or worse. However, uh, in our case, when we perform localization of HIL1 and DCL1 in Arabidopsis cells, uh, we found this for 70% of cells, this equal distribution of both proteins. Only in the case of 30% of cells, you can see these brighter spots here and here. And what is more, more important, um, uh, this uh, um, microRNA precursors do not colocalize with uh, DCL or with HI1. So it means that uh, sites of transcriptions are not related, of microRNAs are not related to the uh, D-bodies. So um, to prove that in fact, the, the, the spots we are observing are in fact uh, transcription sites of microRNAs, uh, we uh, inhibit transcription with alpha amanutin and this signal is gone. Uh, when we perform the same experiment uh, with, uh, with uh, HIL-1 and DCL-1, you can see that the localization of both proteins completely changed. So from this uh, dispersed uh, localization in the nucleus, uh, we observe this accumulation uh, in few spots in the cell. Uh, the same is true for the uh, root tips in Arbidopsis. Here we have um, high one YFP tag line, uh, which shows this dispersed uh, localization. And after blocking uh, transcription, we have uh, one or two uh, spots in the cell. So uh, based on that, we think that uh, these so-called D-bodies are rather uh, places of, of storage for uh, microprocessor components. 
rather than um, places, places where, where in fact uh, processing take place. I don't have uh, much time to, to go into the details about other projects, uh, about the co-transcription of micro biogenesis, but I already mentioned uh, that um, U1, uh, which is recognizing uh, five prime spy site, is involved in, in micro biogenesis. So um, in this case, uh, we found PRP40, uh, which is uh, U1 uh, as an RNP auxiliary protein, um, uh, as an important factor, which uh, creates this bridge between uh, RNA pole 2 and plant microprocessor. In the mutant of PRP40, we observe this huge accumulation of uh, RNA pole 2 on microRNA genes, as well as the uh, increased accumulation of dicer like 1 uh, on microRNA genes, which uh, enhance uh, this, um, our uh, hypothesis about. Uh, co-transcriptional microRNA biogenesis in plants. So I hope that you I convince you about this co-transcriptional uh, microRNA biogenesis, uh, bi microRNA biogenesis in plants. And now I would like to switch to another project. Uh, projects uh, we are working uh, in the lab um, about RNA modifications. It is very uh, very uh, hot topic right now, as all of you know. Um, Currently, we, we know ab about uh, 150 or even more uh, different RNA modifications. Um, some of them are well conserved. So some of them are uh, specific for particular types of, of uh, particular organisms, particular types of RNAs, or uh, even uh, to particular sites within uh, RNA molecule. Unfortunately, in the case of plants, and especially in the case of uh, rna pol 2 transcripts, our knowledge about RNA modification is uh, very limited. Uh, we know about the role of M6A uh, in some processes, like in mRNA stability. Uh, we know about uh, um, changing in uh, uh, translation efficiency, uh, transport, but the, the, in general, knowledge is very narrow. And almost nothing is known about uh, modification of, of small RNAs. So a few years ago, uh, we, we start uh, to be interested in M6A modification. Uh, the uh, M6A uh, complex, uh, I mean, MTA complex uh, in plants is quite similar to the one in animals. Uh, and then the main writer uh, here is MTA, homolog of metal free. So we asked the question if lack of MTA, M6A, will uh, affect a microRNA biogenesis in plants somehow. So we, we did small RNA sequencing and we found that the large uh, number of, of uh, small RNAs uh, uh, are, uh, are decreased in MTA mutant. Uh, and uh, in power, um, precursors um, were rather uh, upregulated. This, this suggests that um, the processing uh, is not efficient um, um, when, when uh, M M6K, M6A is, is missing. Uh, by M6A IP, we proved also that uh, microRNA, plant microRNA precursors uh, um, process M6A and MTA can bind uh, microRNA precursors. Uh, in collaboration with Brian Gregory from uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, we perform uh, analysis of, of uh, uh, microRNA precursor structure with PIPSEC um, analysis. Uh, and you can see that um, in wild type plants, uh, this, uh, on, on the left, uh, precursors uh, looks very nice and they're ready to be processed by microprocessor. However, uh, in, uh, in MTA mutants, uh, where there is no M6A, uh, precursors are uh, very weird and uh, definitely are not a good substrate for, for microprocessor. So there will be no uh, small RNAs production in these uh, cases. Moreover, uh, we found that uh, uh, MTA uh, interacts with uh, RNA pole 2 in Aramidopsis. 
And uh, MTA also interact with another micron abiogenesis uh, factor, TAF, which was previously described uh, to be involved in transcription of micron A genes. So, um, and, and uh, when, we, when we analyzed the distribution of uh, DICER, uh, like one protein HIL1 in MTA mutant and in TAF mutant, you can see, first of all, that the level of, of uh, both proteins lower and uh, from, in white type, we have this equal distribution uh, in, the, in the nucleus. Uh, in the mutants, we can observe this kind of spots here. Uh, and finally, the colocalization between um, components of, of uh, microprocessor and polymerase uh, is much weaker in MTA mutant. So our conclusion is that uh, uh, um, MTA uh, introduced M6A to microRNA uh, precursors co-transcriptionally, and the presence of M6A is important for proper assembly of uh, plant microprocessor. Okay, uh, let's switch to unpublished data uh, and another um, RNA modification. Uh, it will be about pseudouridine. So pseudouridine is isomer of uridine. It's also a highly abundant uh, RNA modification, and it's often called as a fifth nucleotide. It's uh, present in almost all types of RNA, including tRNAs, rRNA, spisosomal uh, uh, RNA, as well as in mRNA. And we know about uh, two different pathways, how uh, pseudouridine can be um, introduced into uh, RNA. First one is so-called RNA dependent, because you need this specific uh, uh, RNA, which will um, guide a protein complex, in this case, discarine, uh, to the target uh, RNA. Another mechanism is uh, uh, called RNA independent because uh, you need just a uh, pass enzyme, so pseudourine synthase enzyme, which can, in some cases, uh, recognize specific motif within RNA and modify it. Uh, in Arabidopsis, we have several uh, pass enzymes. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, for most of them, uh, function and, and even localization is not well described, and we think that uh, most of them may have redundant function. Um, so we uh, uh, found that uh, NHP2, so a component of this discarine complex, uh, can interact with argonaut proteins, with AGO1, 2, 3, 4, and 9. So it was first evidence that there is a connection in plants between pseudouridine pathway and small RNAs. So we confirmed these results uh, using uh, NHP2 uh, immunoprecipitation, and we looked for uh, protein partners with mass spectrometry. You can see that there's plenty of uh, argonaut proteins uh, interacting with NHP2. We also did uh, NHP2 uh, RIPSIC, and we found uh, a lot of microRNA precursors interacting with NHP2. So we already know that, that uh, uh, this discarine complex most probably interact with uh, microRNA precursors. So uh, then we asked the question, how to uh, analyze if, to check if uh, pseudouridine is present in small RNAs, like microRNAs? So first of all, we can use, of course, uh, specific antibodies uh, to immunoprecipitate uh, small RNAs. Another approach is based on uh, CMC. This chemical compound can specifically recognize pseudouridine, and because it's uh, quite big, bulky, uh, it will um, prevent uh, reverse transcriptase uh, during uh, the, the, the reaction. And finally, in, uh, in libraries, we will uh, get a lower level of such a modified uh, uh, small RNAs. We can also modify this CMC treatment protocol uh, to identify uh, specific sites uh, of modification. So finally, we will get uh, sequences with mostly with deletions 
uh, where, where the, the, the pseudo urine was were present. Okay, so based on uh, these three different approaches, uh, we identified uh, several microRNAs which are uh, modified, and among them, four were common for uh, all these uh, three techniques, including 159B highly abundant uh, microRNA in Arabidopsis. We also check if uh, the same uh, sites which are modified in uh, microRNAs, in this case 159B, are also modified in microRNA precursors. And you can see that uh, they mostly overlap, which, which indicates that this modification is introduced uh, already at the level of the precursor. We check also distribution of pseudouridine among uh, all microRNAs, and we found the preference for five prime nucleotide. Uh, of course, we know that uh, five prime, uh, uh, in the case of microRNA, five prime nucleotide is mostly uh, uridine, uh, and uh, the, the five prime nucleotide often determine uh, argonal protein, uh, which will bind a particular small RNA. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in Arabidopsis, we have several uh, pseudo-urine synthesis enzymes. Uh, however, most of them, uh, all, almost all, um, uh, have a redundant function, um, and mutants uh, have no phenotype, with one exception. This is discarin. So in Arabidopsis, discarin is embryolethal. This is why we, we, we created this uh, hypomorphic mutant uh, of discarin with a uh, high decreased level of, of uh, transcript. And this mutant have still a severe phenotype, retarded in growth, strong uh, flower phenotype. And in this mutant, we can observe a decreased level of pseudouridine for particular microRNAs, and it's significantly uh, reduced in all microRNAs as well. Of course, uh, pseudouridine is uh, not only present in microRNAs, it's also present in other siRNAs. But what is uh, more important, um, we found that pseudouridine is uh, presence is related uh, with rather with uh, reproductive organs uh, in in uh, plants. Uh, so in in fluorescence, uh, and even more is even more enriched in in pollen grains. This is why we are focused on uh, Arabidopsis pollen. And in pollen, we have this uh, vegetative nucleus here and two sperm cells. So we, we used uh, fax to sort uh, sperm cells from, from uh, Arabidopsis pollen and to isolate uh, small RNAs. And we try to correlate uh, the sperm cells enrichment of small RNAs with pseudouridine enrichment. And in the case of microRNAs, uh, there was no uh, correlation between those two. However, in the case of sRNAs, you can see this uh, strong correlation pattern between uh, sperm cells uh, presence of sRNAs and enrichment, pseudo enrichment. So we thought that uh, uh, maybe uh, pseudo uridine uh, may be uh, important for loading into particular argonal proteins. Uh, and we, we selected EGO5 and EGO9 because they are highly expressed in sperm cells in Arabidopsis, and EGO1, which is rather um, equally distributed, uh, equally expressed in, in Arabidopsis pollen. Unfortunately, you can see on these heat maps that uh, we couldn't find uh, any preference for for uh, tested argonal proteins? So uh, at this at this uh, point, I cannot uh, say that that uh, pseudouridine makes a difference at this in pollen to uh, to to for loading into particular uh, argonal proteins. So we were looking for another uh, function of of pseudouridine in small RNAs, and another factor which would be uh, responsible. Uh, involved in this pathway. And uh, it's known that uh, pseudouridine is important for uh, movement of mRNA, tRNAs. And um, so we thought that, that uh, it's worth to look in, in uh, 
Paust mutant. Paust is the homologue of uh, exporting uh, T, so uh, protein which is in, uh, involved in the transport of tRNAs, which are also modified, of course. And um, you can see that uh, in, in Paust pollen, uh, the pseudo U enrichment uh, of microRNA is reproduced. And the same is for easy RNAs. Easy RNAs are known to be mobile, uh, are known to be mobile uh, within uh, Arabidopsis pollen. Easy RNAs are uh, epigenetically activated uh, small RNAs, uh, which are produced uh, as a result of uh, microRNA 845 cleavage. And uh, production of, of uh, easy RNAs uh, require, uh, for production of easy RNAs, pol 4 is also required. So you can see that uh, microRNA 845 targets are also uh, less enriched in pseudouridine in Paus mutant, the same as pol 4 dependent TEs. So we go back to our uh, sperm cells uh, results, and um, we found that uh, easy RNAs, which are uh, modified, and derived from vegetative, nu vegetative nucleus are uh, highly uh, post dependent uh, in opposite to uh, easy RNAs, uh, which are produced uh, in sperm cells. So uh, based on that and other results uh, I didn't show you, uh, we, we have this model um, that in Arabidopsis pollen, uh, small RNAs, including microRNAs and easy RNAs are modified and some of them are exported from the vegetative nucleus with PAUST to the sperm cells. So with that, I would like to end and thank um, our group at the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań, Zofia Szwajkowska, Kolinska and Artur Jarmowski, or my colleagues from the lab and from the Institute. Um, uh, I would like to mention Rob Martinson and, and his group all this uh, pseudo urine project uh, was was uh, done in his lab during my stay uh, at Cold Peak Harbor. And also I'd like to thank our collaborators and founding sources. And I'd be happy to, to take the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jakub. Let me figure it out. Uh, Q and A. So I don't see any questions here, um, but I have a question <laughs> in this case. So uh, a, a very, very naive question. So all those uh, modified um, small RNAs, uh, when they are exported, so they export it and they are, there's plenty of them cytoplasm. So what do you think, um, why they are so important? So is it just, um, and they are bound by different complexes, right? But so what, what, what happens then? Why why they are that why these modifications are so important? Can you speculate on this? So uh, right now we know that that uh, pseudouridine is not important for the loading into uh, argonauts within pollen. However, we have other results from from other tissues that uh, pseudouridine can be important. For example, uh, for the movement between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. This is one thing. So because some some microRNAs can be, I mean most of the microRNAs are exported the cytoplasm, but some of them are retained in the nucleus and can act on the chromatin, for example, and and we have some evidences that 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 uh, this is um, uh, that pseudo U uh, play a role in in this mechanism as well, and uh, you have to remember that some of microRNAs and other siRNAs can be exported outside of the cell. And this is okay. uh, completely uh, another uh, other field, uh, to, and 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 uh, there's a lot of things to 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 discover, and and I think that RNA modification might be crucial for this long distance, let's say, transport of of uh, small RNAs. Okay, very interesting. But there's another question. Actually, there's more questions. Uh, they're coming up right now. Do the pseudouridines increase the stability of the microRNAs, which are already very stable? Well, uh, most probably yes, but we uh, haven't tested uh, stability. Uh, as, as somebody asked, yeah, microRNAs are quite stable, uh, so we 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 haven't checked that yet. But it's a good 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 idea to do it. Yeah. 
And maybe another question, what might be the importance of suuridine at the very five prime end of microRNAs? So um, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, five prime nucleotide is important for the loading to the argonaut protein. Depending on the nucleotide at the five prime end of, of uh, small RNA, uh, it will go to particular uh, argonaut protein. So uh, it's 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 the the, the one uh, of the possibility that that uh, the loading is is important. Nevertheless, we were not able to to show it in in the pollen. Okay, there is uh, two more questions, perhaps one more, and then maybe Jakub, you can continue answering them on the, in sure. the, in the okay. chat. So maybe one more. So uh, Kinga is asking, could you please comment briefly on the similarities and differences between RNA modification usage in plants and animals? Well, uh, I think that uh, our knowledge about RNA modification in plants is still very limited in comparison to what we, we, we know in, in, in other organisms. So uh, I would be afraid to, you know, to sp speculate about the scale or something like this. Uh, but but uh, yeah, uh, in plants, uh, when you cannot escape from, from, from environmental stresses, this uh, signaling pathway is very important. So, so I think that the uh, in the case of, of plants and small RNAs, this, this uh, transport of the information between between the different compartments uh, might be a, a good idea for, for, for looking. Okay. Thank you, Jakub. There is more, more question, questions for you, so please, if you could please okay. uh, ask them in the chat. Thank you so much. Okay, Thank our next, next speaker is uh, Zbigniew uh, Warkowski. He is a PI at the Institute of Bioorganic uh, Chemistry in Poznań. Uh, Zbyszek did his uh, PhD in, at the Max Planck Institute of Biophysical Chemistry with Lurman, working on uh, mechanism of splicing using Cerevisi as a model. He then did his uh, post, uh, postdoc with Andrzej Dzimbowski in Warsaw, working on uh, RNA regulation and uh, the role of this process in uh, retrotransposition. And in 2018, I believe, he started uh, his own group here in Poznań and he continues working on um, post-transcriptional RNA metabolism. Uh, Zbyszek, we are looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Yes, hello everyone. It's my pleasure to join this uh, nice RNA collaborative series. And uh, it's my pleasure to talk about some of our recent results. Um, I think I need to share my screen. That will be the one. Okay, so I hope you can see everything. Uh, am I right? Yes, just do the presentation mode, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so today I would like to share some of our recent results uh, done here uh, in Poznań. And I will be talking about the role of three prime non-templated uh, and dynamics in line one retrotransposon biology. Uh, line one, uh, is a special class of uh, RNAs um, belonging to a bigger class that in fact constitutes, uh, in case of the human genome, uh, nearly half of it. And uh, these are repetitive elements that uh, can uh, populate uh, and propagate in the human and other organism genomes. Uh, line uh, constitutes roughly 17% of the human genome. And um, it, uh, it provides all the machinery for its own mobilization. It also provides molecular machinery for mobilization of ALUs that are primate specific and SFAS that are hominid specific and other uh, retro elements that are there and not even listed uh, here. So uh, active line one element, the gene, is uh, flanked by target site applications that are uh, common uh, features of uh, retrotransposons. And then it has its own five prime UTR uh, with its own promoter. Uh, it encodes two open reading frames, ORF1 and ORF2. ORF1 is kind of a chaperone protein that packs up on um, its mRNA of origin upon translation. And then ORF2 is uh, a big protein with multiple functions, multiple 
um, enzymatic uh, activities. I think the most important is the endonuclease, is the reverse transcriptase. These are the enzymatic activities, and then there are um, uh, other uh, structural features. Uh, just recently, uh, two papers in Nature uh, appeared in this month uh, uh, with structures of, of uh, human ORF2. Uh, it has a polyadenylation signal that is, however, weak. Very often, uh, downstream polyadenylation signals are used, which leads to transduction of genomic sequences downstream of line, and this might contribute to as much as 1% of the human genome. Um, now the replication cycle of line one in the uh, in the genome starts with transcription of an active full-length copy. There are roughly 80 to 100 such copies in the genome, followed by trans, uh, export into the cytoplasm, translation um, uh, into uh, uh, into those two uh, proteins and ORF1. Um, uh, is produced in multiple copies or two just maybe in one copy per one mRNA. Mm, and um, uh, this is in fact also a peculiarity of line that is a DC stronic mRNA uh, in human cell. So if it has a chance of being reimported either actively or passively during cell division into the nucleus, then the ORF2 here in, um, in purple and magenta can nick genomic DNA releasing very often a short oligo DT stretch that can base pair with a poly A tail of line one mRNA, giving a primer or constituting a primer for reverse transcription and thus uh, reintegration of a of an element in the new genomic location. So a couple of years ago, uh, we studied uh, those lines and uh, this. Um, um, left part of the uh, uh, of the panel shows more or less uh, what I just discussed, where the, le uh, uh, the other part shows uh, more real life situation. So, uh, to cut the long story short, we identified um, um, that the three prime end of line, the non template the three prime end of line, is not uh, and is rarely a pure poly A and a long poly A. It's rather um, uh, being uh, modified. And there we identified MOF10 and tatases as being involved in uh, uridylating with three prime ends. And um, uh, we postulated at the time somehow uh, provocatively uh, that uh, uridylation might uh, interfere with base pairing of oligo DT. And thus uh, we observed uh, reduced retrotransposition of a uridylated substance. But this will be kind of followed up. And uh, I think that at the time we could tell that we identified the healers here of, uh, of line 1. Now, when I started uh, my own lab, or in fact, a couple of years ago, but not in 2018, the lab as such years, but uh, I, uh, the project was started later. It was started in 2021, uh, shortly after the pandemic. So we asked the question whether uh, we can test other post-transcriptional um, okay I will just uh, answer it later whether we have other uh, post-transcriptional factors that we might possibly use as tools uh, to test how these three prime n dynamics uh, work and what they mean uh, to line one retrotransposition what they mean to line one biology and so we uh, decided to uh, test exon one the major 5' prime to 3' prime exoribonuclease, and DCP2, uh, which is um, uh, decapping uh, enzyme in DCP1-2 complex. And decapping is stimulated by uridylation. So we wanted to kind of either reduce them by RNAi or knock them down or knock them out by genomic CRISP-Cas uh, mediated knockouts and see what happens to retrotransposition and go through all these different uh, aspects of line one biology. And so the hypothesis would be if we knock down something that degrades line one mRNA, then we would expect more line one mRNA in the cell and hence uh, more retrotransposition. And to test that, uh, we have used line one reporter assay 
Uh, it relies on a plasmid-based reporter that encodes a full-length human line and then the reporter cassette uh, in the antisense orientation interrupted with an intron, so following splicing out of the intron or splicing of, uh, of this um, a reporter, in, um, in this case EGFP, uh, it might be inserted from the tree prime end uh, specifically as the tree prime end is, uh, as I already um, mentioned, the site where retrotransposition starts. So the first thing to be inserted into the genome will be the reporter cassette, now without an intron to differentiate between um, uh, just reporter from plasmid and the one that got successfully integrated. And so we performed RNAi of XRN1, and to our surprise, we had to repeat it a couple of times because I wasn't so much uh, convinced that I wanted to make sure that it's truly the, uh, the case. We did observe that uh, knocking down XRN1 actually reduces retrotransposition and not increases it as the hypothesis zero uh, stated. And here's the Western blot showing that we got some reduction between 12 and 25 percent of the white type levels. So having this in hand, uh, we decided to create XRN1 knockout cells in 293T background um, and uh, not just uh, and create as many as we can um, and test them all um, uh, simultaneously. And so we succeeded in creating six knockouts, as you can see by Western blot and confirmed by uh, sequencing of the genome and also validate and authenticated the cell lines. And then we had our parental 293T and some other clones that actually retained XN1. Uh, and we used those cells for retrotransposition reporter assay along the procedure I already described. And so we saw that each of the wild types, so this is the very first experiment, but it has two uh, replicates for each biological condition. Um, the wild type supported much more retrotransposition than the X1 knockouts, which um, uh, kind of also eludes that there is a dose dependency on X1. So we confirmed our RNAi experiments, and that's the matrix showing a combination of different cell lines uh, against each other, how uh, big the difference in retrotransposition was. So the median for all combinations were roughly 12. Uh, why for some of them um, uh, it reached 60 and for some of them it was much lower like two. So there is a variability and this kind of justifies that the uh, approach we took uh, by testing multiple wild types, multiple knockouts uh, was right you know, because we could have chosen either extreme and either observe no or small changes or observe very big changes. You know? So I think that was Rational. We performed many control experiments. I'm showing some of them. For example, apoptosis. We observed slightly more apoptosis in 293T, but then uh, we performed this retro test in a time resolved manner, in a way that we normally score it after four or five days of, of, uh, of a test. And then we also kind of saved part of these cells, cultivated them for six, seven more days and scored again um, uh, for how many EGF positive cells there were by flow cytometry. And we observed that with both wild type cells and the XRN knockout cells, we do observe more retrotransposition at these later points. And the more uh, retrotransposition was supported initially, the more we actually have. But this experiment, I found it uh, important because it would um, it, it shows that there is no kind of elimination of the uh, um, retrotransposition positive cells from the pool in either of the condition we are testing the wild type or the XRN1 KO. Um, then we also uh, tested the cell cycle, which uh, there were significant changes in 293T. Uh, retrotransposition was shown to specifically occur in S or GM phases. So we could say maybe there is some effect of a cell cycle here. However, we also created other cell line HeLa uh, with the XRN1 KO. Um, we looked for changes in the cell cycle, then they were not very much consistent with those of the 293T or partially. Yet the phenotype was conserved we observed the less retrotransposition, as uh, you can see, by less um, blue spots towards the control 
uh, in these extra long KO uh, replicates as compared to the wild type replicates for the retro transposition reporter assay and the positive uh, control of the selection that we applied here. Mm. Okay, so we then decided to perform a rescue experiment whereby we provided ectopically expressed XLN1 from plasmids into the knockout cells, and you can see validation of that approach by Western blot. And we did observe rescue of retrotransposition in these knockout cells following uh, 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 ectopic expression of XLN1. This was dose dependent. This did not occur or occurred much less uh, effectively with uh, mutants of XLN1 that were defective in the exoribonuclease. Uh, which suggests, or in fact, supports the idea that exoribonucleolytic activity of XLN1 is important for, um, uh, for line one retrotransposition in our condition. So we then decided to test uh, what happens to line one mRNA levels. And the steady state levels were actually higher by, um, um, by Northern Belt, by QPCR, in the KO, XLN1 KO. Uh, cells done in the wild types. And uh, this was because they were more stable in the xn one k or cells done in the wild types, as revealed by time course using actinomycin uh, DS. We also, by selecting a cap through EIF4G mutant protein, um, demonstrated that there is a decrease in the amount of cap line one mRNAs in the xn one k or and this could possibly explain what we observed then with expression of uh, li line one proteins, specifically ORF1 tagged with either EGFP and chain also flag, which is not shown here. By flow cytometry, we observed decrease in production of these proteins in XL1 KO. However, and importantly, we did not observe such an effect with a reporter that has no tag on ORF1. Um, just giving some impression that the tag on of one might uh, create some uh, some issues with uh, the protein stability and functionality. Uh, we used uh, imaging flow cytometry to assess the number of so-called line one bodies, which are uh, aggregates of line one uh, or one P in the cytoplasm. There's also of two. There's line one mRNA but uh, it's easiest to uh, visualize by uh, tagging of one with a fluorescent tag, like in here. And so we photographed thousands of cells to see that the distribution in the wild types here in pink and in the x one KO cells is different. And specifically in the x one KO cells, we observe slightly less of those bodies, but this is seven as compared to eight in the wild types. And which I'm which, what I'm going to tell you very shortly is that we acquired some cell lines from a different lab from uh, Yale and performed similar experiments. And with all of them, with excellent one KO and also with DCP2 KO and a double KO, we observe the same phenotype. So we decided to investigate the uh, three prime ends, the non templated three prime ends of line. Uh, in our conditions, and we used uh, an approach um, uh, which uh, um, uh, creates Illumina uh, sequencing libraries. And to um, to um, tell you what we saw is that we actually uh, divided those non-templated ends into a couple of classes. Those were polyadenylated, so the A uh, type, type class. These were the polyadenylated or oligoadenylated and uridylated, so a couple of A's and then one or more U. And this was AU class in, uh, in orange in this graph. These were the U taste, so just the genomically encoded and a couple of U's. And that was a note, likely a degradation intermediate or a technique artifact. And the most striking difference was with the AU take class that, as you can see, between the wild types and chaos grows um, in um, abundance. But it also uh, very much changes uh, in the lengths of these tails. So in the wild types, the six individual cell lines you can see here, these tails are roughly 37, um, I think, the median length uh, of them. But in the chaos cells, they're 
I think 12 or 15. So there is a substantial decrease in the length. Then there's also a change in the length of the poly A um, tails. And the KO here is in blue and the wire types is in red. So basically those tails are deadenylated to different extents, but they are deadenylated in X1 KO. And they acquire more uridine tails in the X1 KO as compared here, uh, again, the greenish lines are the wild types and the magenta and violet are the extra one KO cells. And here, the more blue, the longer the U tails are. All right, so I told you about these different cells that uh, we acquired from a different lab. And so here is validation, independent validation of the knockouts. And we performed retrotransposition reporter assays with them. Again, with X1, we observed a decrease in retrotransposition with reporters with two different um, uh, promoters uh, of a reporter, a line one reporter. Um, so this is not dependent on the endogenous promoter, it's dependent on the three prime end. And then we observed that DCP2K, although less effectively, but also there is less retrotransposition than in the Y types and more than the X1. Uh, KO. And the double KO was also low in terms of retrotransposition. However, you have to bear in mind that these are just single uh, knockouts as opposed to the six um, versus six that we showed with uh, our in house made uh, cell lines. So we also tested the amounts of uh, line one proteins in these uh, uh, cells, and we observed that uh, line one of 1P is indeed less. Um, in um, the X1 KO, but it is more in the DCP2 KO. And there is also more line one of 2P in the DCP2 KO. And uh, along with this, there is more gamma H2AX in the DCP2 KO. And this is a marker for, um, um, for example, double strand breaks in the genomic DNA that are caused by the nicking uh, activity of two. So this is in line with the changes we observe uh, on the level of the very proteins. So we tested again by using this uh, RACIC libraries um, in, on Illumina, um, the AU tails in this case, um, uh, in this different uh, independent erased cell lines and observe the same phenomenon with the DCP2KO and the double KO as we observed with X1 KO. So we basically have this um, uh, increased uh, uridylation of ATAs, they simultaneously shortening the deadenylation of the uh, long uh, ATAs. Those uridylated ATAs are still bound by the ORF2P, which is shown here. We did the RACIC on IPs of ORF1 and ORF2, and we basically observed that uh, the ORF2 um, IPs uh, comprise line one mRNAs that are uridylated or they have this AU tails as well. So as you think of what happens uh, in the degradation of um, any RNA, mRNA, that it follows certain steps and it's kind of um, a sequential activity of different factors. So we would say that there's deadenylation followed by uridylation, followed by decapping, stimulated by, in fact, by uridylation and ultimate degradation. And so we recapitulated those in our retrotransposition reporter assays, whereby um, depletion of tatases that at uridines actually increases retrotransposition levels. However, when depletion of tatases is combined with depletion of exceran one, uh, that as, uh, as you already know, decreases retrotransposition, we actually observe uh, retrotransposition at the level similar to, decre to depletion of tatases only and not to the depletion of X1, meaning that we basically need the relation to observe the effects um, at the later stages of the sequential um, stepwise pathway of degradation of line. And so we decided also to test the endogenous lines and uh, this is the newest data. Uh, as with this reporter without um, Mm, the tag, we actually did not observe so much changes on the endogenous ORF1P in the different wild type and XN1 clones, 
we did observe some though non-significant uh, enrichment in um, the level of uh, line one mRNA in both cells, and that's okay. It's perfectly okay. In PA1 cells that uh, express more lines, uh, that we can actually see it by northern blot, and that uh, support more retrotransposition, we do observe that there is stabilization of endogenous line in XL1 uh, KD, in this case, and DCP2KD by RNAi because we failed in generating the knockout cell lines in this background. And there is an increase in the amounts of proteins, but in both uh, conditions. So we actually have some kind of conservation of line one stabilization um, in uh, different cell lines. And then we performed the RACIC analysis to observe, and we, we split those line ones into the uh, newest retrotransposition competent um, class of lines and the older class of lines. So to basically see the endogenous lines in 293T undergo very similar changes like the um, reported lines. So basically there's a decrease in polyadenylation, increase in uridylation and the fraction of the AU tails for both um, young, younger and older classes. And a uh, very similar uh, effect is in the PA where uh, the fraction of this polyadenylated drops in the uh, KD conditions um, and the fraction of uh, uridylated increases. And so as what we already have shown some time ago is that even a single uridine or two uridines uh, decrease retrotransposition versus non-uridylated uh, reporters. And this we uh, established by reporters that had predefined three prime ends uh, uh, generated by RNAs P uh, cleavage in the nucleus. And we also observed that short oligoadenylated uh, uridine tails, they don't support retrotransposition at all, while the longer do support, but they uh, do not like uridines on the three prime ends. And so what we see in terms of the length of those A-tase, AU-tase um, in the um, endogenous lines is that they are actually short. They are usually around 20 nucleotide long and they are heavily uridylated as you uh, already saw. So in other words, they are very suboptimal for retrotransposition. So here we come to the conclusion. So we used those X1 DCP2 KOs and KDs as tools to demonstrate the dynamics of line one three prime end and the effects it has on uh, line one retrotransposition in biology. And so in normal situation, line one mRNA is uh, deadenylated, it's uridylated in action of MOV10, tateases, and then uh, decapped by DCP2. Um, and then ultimately degraded. If we knock down, uh, if we knock out extra one, then uh, we still have DCP2, so we have de decapping. Uh, we have uh, actually increase in the amount of line one mRNA, but decrease in translation. We have increase in uridylation. If we knock out DCP2, then we have extra one, but doesn't degrade that. So we actually have an increase in line one translation because there is more caps on them. But we have also an increase in uridylation and uh, increase the deadenylation of line one mRNAs. And hence we have a decrease in line one retrotransposition. And this paper has actually just yesterday been accepted uh, for publication in nucleic acid research and this is our group's contribution. And to make the easier conclusion is that when you have long poly -ATs, you are likely to retrotranspose. When you have them short and you redilated, you are likely not retrotranspose. So here I go with um, uh, acknowledgements for the um, members of the team who did the uh, studies uh, and uh, our um, collaborators, the funding sources. And uh, we also, uh, as this RNA collaborative series is, uh, is a very good chance of meeting people and listen to interesting talks. We also organize them live uh, uh, on the spot in our institute, sometimes we invite uh, people uh, to join us uh, and then we provide these uh, seminars uh, in a hybrid form. So we invite you to check those web pages and also to join them live as the RNA Salon Poznan and invited seminars of the institute. So thank you a lot for your attention. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Spyshek. Fantastic talk. Um, 
We have a few questions. I think we have time maybe for all of them. Let's start with questions. So the first question is, do you have a reference for the fractions of the genome that are repetitive? Uh, do I have uh, a, reference? a reference for the fractions of the genome that are repetitive? Um, fractions of a reference for fractions of a genome that are repetitive. Fractions of a genome. I don't understand this question. I'm sorry. Um, uh, perhaps Thomas can clarify in the chat. So there are some consensus sequences that um, that are. Um, that are known for lines, okay, and for different classes. So these are by reference. They do differ by some minor changes. Um, I'm not sure whether I answered this question. Um, perhaps you can carry on doing that in the chat. Uh, there's another question. Did you see non differentiated expression changes of two tases and this three, IL2, or even more than up on the 